pretty cool to have this many people interested. Um, of course, everybody knows this is a defense um, seminar for Jesse DeVoe. Jesse has been here at MSU for a long time, uh, not too long. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I first met Jesse, I had probably had him in some of our early undergraduate classes and didn't even notice him, and then he got into one of our, I think it was the first year I taught techniques, was it? Mm -hmm. He always sat at the back, he was real quiet. <laughs> really, even though it was a small class, I didn't really notice him much, other than he was a really good student when I graded everything. And then he ended up, we ended up hiring him to uh, be a technician on the Central Yellowstone ecosystem studies we did, and got to know him there, and he fell in love with Central Yellowstone, like some other people in this, in this room that had been on that study. And uh, I'm not sure if he wouldn't have continued there, but then he was interested in going down to Antarctica with Jay and I on our SEAL studies, and then he got really hooked. And I think he would have never went to graduate school if we would have, if we would have agreed to keep hiring him to go down there and work on the ice with us, which is the only time I really spent a lot of time in the field with him. But, but that's a pretty cool experience for our students to get to. Then he worked on Megan O'Reilly's, um, a graduate student, a previous graduate student of ours, who started this work. Um, and uh, on mountain goats, and actually it was supposed to be mountain goats and becoming sheep, um, together to look at competition in the Yellowstone system, and Jesse will give you an introduction to that. And uh, maybe did a great job of getting that work started, but we still had a long ways to go. And Jesse was a technician for Megan, knew the system, did a really good job. And uh, what we try to do is mentor students as technicians, and then if they do a good job and they're and they show everything we're looking for in a graduate student. We try to move into a graduate program. And so Jesse stepped right up and did that. And I must admit, Jay, this was Jay's idea, these occupancy studies. <laughs> and uh, when we got this started, and I thought it was a great idea until we tried to implement it. <laughs> and uh, Megan can certainly know the struggles. It, it sounds good in theory, you know, that kind of sampling. And, and then you try to do it out on a man landscape like we had it had to try to do, and that was a challenge. And then we, Megan got us through that part, and then, and then Jesse continued to collect the data. And then we had to be thinking about analysis, and Jay brought in the, the people that invented this, essentially. And they sat there, and they weren't quite sure what we should do with the data now that we had collected it. So then both I and Jesse were really worried whether or not we had gone down the wrong, wrong path. But everybody stuck with it and contributed. And I think, um, I hope that you'll see at the end of Jesse's seminar that we've got some important biological insight out of the work, um, besides training a really good um, young professional to move into the career track, at least if he makes it through a couple hours after the seminar. <laughs> so, with that, Jesse. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction, Bob. It certainly has been a pleasure working with Bob on his various projects and being mentored by him as well. Um, and I wanted to thank all of you for coming out today to my thesis defense. It's great to see so many people, and uh, I'm sure it's because of the mountain goats that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure many of you are familiar with a scene like this uh, during your exploits and adventures into the mountains. Big, mountainous landscape, steep, complex terrain. And when you're out there, you may have noticed these two little white dots. And those white dots are often mountain goats, if they're not patches of snow. So here it's a nanny and a kid just making their living on this uh, steep and complex environment. Uh, many people aren't familiar with the fact that these are a introduced non-native species to the greater Yellowstone. And uh, while they're native in places in, uh, in Western North America and in Montana, such as Glacier National Park, there, the Greater Yellowstone is considered a new home for these species. And the uh, management agencies across this region have shared a considerable cons amount of concern for this, this introduced species. And the reason for this concern is because of our collective experience with non-natives and their impacts. They are now considered a widespread and significant component of human-caused global environmental change. 
And we have had our fair share of uh, examples of them here in the greater Yellowstone, including, for example, uh, lake trout in Yellowstone Lake that have caused the near decimation of Yellowstone cutthroat trout populations through predation. A fungal pathogen in whitebark pine causing disease and die-offs at an ecosystem-wide scale. And the invasion of the New Zealand mud snail that, uh, to streams and rivers that outcompetes native invertebrates for space and food resources. And it's this last idea of competition that I'd like to focus in on. So using the mud snails as an example, if we have two species, so here we have the native caddis fly and the non-native um, mud snail. And they use the same limiting resource uh, in the same way. So on this resource gradient, we might call that cobble size. And they use it in the same way. They would have overlapping use of that resource. And they cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. Whichever of these species uses that resource more efficiently or, fe or effectively um, will have the competitive advantage and exclude the other species. This is known as the competitive exclusion principle. However, if there are at least some differences in their ecological niches or their ability to partition their use of the resources in some way that limits competition, these two species can coexist. And discerning these potentially small differences in niches or um, use of the resource or how they use the resource um, requires fine scale habitat selection information. And when we have this sort of fine scale habitat selection information, we can then, for the non native species, predict its expansion or predict its spatial distribution as uh, it continues occupying new areas. And it's this sort of information that I'm interested in for the introduced mountain goat in the Greater Yellowstone. So most of you are familiar with the Greater Yellowstone. I'll call it GYA uh, occasionally. Um, but it's right out our back door. It's considered the largest uh, intact temperate ecosystem in the world. And you can see Yellowstone National Park, the big green area, and um, Grand Teton National Park uh, make up a significant portion of it. And it's composed of a uh, generally a high elevation mountainous area that is apparently really great habitat for mountain goats. From the early 1940s <coughs> to the early 1970s, 170 mountain goats were released across nine sites in the GYA. And many of these uh, goats were captured from native places in Idaho and Montana, and they were transported by various uh, adventurous means, including whitewater rafting, to their new homes in the greater Yellowstone. And they were introduced for hunting opportunity. Um, so this was a, a pretty good success. From these introduction sites, uh, they marched outward. So if we start in 1960, there were only a handful of observations from management agencies of mountain goats and 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, and up to 2012, you can see how much they have expanded in distribution across the greater Yellowstone. In, um, and they continue to occupy new areas, including areas occupied by native populations of bighorn sheep, the blue dots here. Um, in the northern GYA, mountain goats have become fully established and they have shared their general range with uh, bighorn sheep for approximately 50 years. And there's significant potential for mountain goats to continue expanding into the North Absarokas where the largest and healthiest native unsupplemented um, population of bighorn sheep exist. And then also up from the Palisades region in Idaho and Wyoming into Grand Teton National Park where there's two small native <coughs> herds and then into the Grovelt and the Wind River mountain ranges. Management agencies across the GYA are concerned that this invading mountain goat may have negative impacts to the native bighorn. And this is mostly because they they occupy similar habitats on the landscape, there is a potential that they may compete. So for example, this is along the Gallatin Crest, 
uh, at a salt bait site. You can see both species there. This is another salt bait site on the Beartooth Plateau. Same place, uh, less than a day apart. And in the field, we would also uh, occasionally see them within very close proximity of each other. Here we have two mountain goats bedded within uh, 10 feet of, native, uh, of a bighorn herd that are also bedded. So they have this potential to compete. But given that they've shared a long evolutionary history together, and they coexist in places where they are both native, uh, we might expect that they have partitioned their, their uh, ecological niches or their use of resources in some way that has limited competition and has allowed them to coexist. However, there is very limited information about habitat selection for these species that is at a fine scale enough of a detail to be able to discern the differences between their ecological niches. And the reason for this is mostly due to the difficulty in collecting data for these species. They inhabit large landscapes that are complex and often remote, making access, travel, and uh, surveying difficult. They are relatively rare on the landscape, um, so it makes it difficult to obtain a sufficient sample size. And they're not always detected, even though they are present on the landscape. <laughs> So how do we collect habitat selection data? Well, we could use uh, some traditional methods, which include aerial survey data. And this is often collected by management agencies across the greater Yellowstone. Or we could use GPS telemetry data. You can see the, the white GPS color on this mountain goat. However, uh, we were particularly interested in an alternative, more rigorous uh, method and that is Mackenzie et al.'s occupancy uh, sampling techniques and modeling. So this, this technique, you take the landscape and you can break it up into sampling units. You can then visit those sampling units and survey for both the presence and absence of the species of interest. And with that information, we can then estimate probabilities of detection, which is indicated by little p, and probabilities of occupancy indicated by the Greek letter Psi. And with that, we can make inference to habitat selection. So we, were, we wanted to use these occupancy methods, so we essentially retrofitted them in order to understand fine-scale habitat selections for habitat selection for these mountain ungulates that occupy these big uh, difficult to survey landscapes. And so again, I want to give credit to Megan O'Reilly, who was essential in developing these methods for her master's thesis. And so I'll get into those methods in a bit, but my main objective was to use those occupancy methods to model summer habitat selection of mountain goats. And if that went well, I then wanted to predict suitable habitat for the for the entire greater Yellowstone to uh, give an estimate of where mountain goats may be if they occupied all their habitat. And then I want to estimate the total abundance that might be supported by that habitat. So to do this, we selected two study areas in the northern uh, GYA, and these were two areas we felt captured a range of variation in mountainous terrain as well as had well-established populations of mountain goats that are sympatric, or they share, share the general range with um, um, bighorn sheep. And they, they've been sharing that range for about 50 years in these locations. So for summers 2011 and 2012, we spent in the Gallatin Crest region in the northwest corner of Yellowstone Park and in the Gallatin National Forest. And in summer of 2013, we were in the North Asaroka study area in the northeast corner and in the Gallatin and Shoshone National Forest. For all three summers, we collected data from mid-June to mid-October and uh, during the full range of daylight hours. So how did we implement these occupancy methods? Well, 
we can imagine we have the landscape that we intend to survey. And if we put a grid across that landscape, these grid cells are 100 meters by 100 meters, and I'll refer to them as sampling units from here on out. If we put that on aerial maps on field computers, we took those out into the field with us, and we set out to uh, survey those sampling units. And to do that, we first uh, created a travel route through the, the landscape that could accommodate a three to five day backpacking trip. The first survey point was randomly selected within the first three kilometers, and then each survey point thereafter was systematically placed every three kilometers. From those survey points, so for the second one, for example, we would survey the viewshed of sampling units that was visible to us, and we would document everywhere we detected a mountain goat group, the red dots, and everywhere we did not detect a mountain goat group, the yellow dots. At the same time, a second independent observer surveyed the same viewshed and recorded the same information. And this allows us to estimate detection. Sometimes both observers would detect this, the mountain goat group in the same sampling unit, and at other times only one observer would detect the mountain goat group in the sampling unit. I analyzed the data with a single, McKenzie et al, single species, single season, occupancy modeling, and I estimated detection and occupancy probabilities, and I modeled the variation in these parameters with habitat covariates. I used the uh, quasi-likelihood version of AIC to rank the relative support of models I was interested in looking at, and also to account for any non-independence in the data. So to model occupancy probability, I gathered several habitat covariates in a GIS framework, and these were based on a literature review, as well as hypotheses of habitat relationships that I had. And I arranged them in four model suites. And these model suites were used to address specific hypotheses, as well as to redu reduce otherwise uh, large and complex model lists. From each model suite, I, I selected the um, most supported models within five QAIC units of the top model and included them in all possible additive combinations in a combined model suite. And from that combined model suite, uh, I then selected the most supported model as my model for inference to habitat selection for mountain goats. As part of my analysis, I also wanted to account for the fact that species select uh, different resources on the landscape at different spatial scales. For example, if this, this blue polygon is a mountain goat's home range, it includes all this mountainous area, and within that home range they select for these steep terrain sites, the gray polygons, they might be selecting for these sites at a larger spatial, spatial scale than they may be for, say, foraging sites, the green polygons. <coughs> and given that uh, uh, scale-specific relationships have been found to be important in many other species, and they have not been looked at for, mount for mountain goats, I wanted to include this in my analysis. So to do that, if we imagine this is a landscape with a, uh, our 100 meter by 100 meter grid on it, for the spatial scale that I called 100 meters, I averaged each individual habitat covariate raster for each of those sampling units. <clears throat> for the spatial scale of 300 meter, I did a three by three neighborhood analysis average for each sampling unit. And similarly, for 500 meters, 700, and 900. So I had a total of 500 meters, 500 um, spatial scales that I was evaluating for each habitat covariate. Additionally, instead of assuming that all uh, selection for these resources occurs in a linear relationship, I wanted to lend flexibility to that relationship. And I also, in addition to a linear form, included a quadratic and a pseudo-threshold, which is a natural log transform, uh, for each habitat covariate. 
All right, so dive back into the model suites. Uh, I'm only going to spend much time in the slope terrain suite, um, and then I'll breeze through the other ones. But uh, the slope terrain, terrain suite was included because mountain goats are tightly associated with steep terrain and predominantly supported in many habitat models of mountain goats is this distance to escape terrain covariate. And it's uh, named in reference to the areas that mountain goats use as refuge from predators. And it measures the distance to the, to the nearest area of a specified slope threshold. So for example, if you have a distance to escape terrain covariate of 25 degrees, everything from 25 degrees to 90 degrees is considered escape terrain. And it measures the distance to those areas. However, this uh, covariate has been variously and often subjectively defined in the literature. In addition, it assumes that all selection for slopes greater than that sle the slope threshold is <coughs> considered equal quality to mountain goats. So for example, if we have this cross-section of the landscape, landscape, some areas have 45 degrees and others have 90 degrees. If we have a distance to escape terrain covariate of a slope threshold with 45 degrees, this is saying that selection, mountain goat selection for steep areas increases as slope increases to 45 degrees, but everything beyond 45 degrees is considered the same, it's of equal quality to mountain goats, and um, selection is constant. It's all escape terrain. However, what if mountain goats select for intermediate slopes? So this mountain goat likes uh, 45 degrees, but he doesn't like the flatter areas or the steep 90 degrees. That relationship might look something like this. This distance to escape terrain covariate does not capture this. And um, also, mountain goats may prefer areas with higher variation in slope. And the distance to escape terrain covariate also does not capture that as well. And, these are, and like, this relationship is a very uh, plausible thing to happen. And so I had a, um, a hypothesis that, I, that these two new covariates, the mean slope and slope variance covariates, would better capture this, um, this uh, relationship. It would be more biologically meaningful than distance to escape terrain covariates. And so, in the slope terrain suite, I compared various versions of distance to escape terrain that have been uh, used in the literature with these new mean slope and slope variance covariates uh, eva uh, evaluated at the different functional forms and spatial scales. All right, and to breeze through these other um, model suites, I included a rug in this suite to evaluate additional terrain-related uh, covariates. A forage suite, um, habitat, summer habitat models have not, uh, in the previous literature, have not incorporated uh, a summer forage metric in their model, even though we often see them utilizing um, areas such as this. So I want to incorporate that into my models. Uh, I included a heat load suite, and this was based on uh, other studies that have looked at mountain ungulates and other areas that have found a sensitivity to higher summer temperatures. And I had a hypothesis that uh, mountain goats were similar based on uh, places that we would find them, uh, the cooler areas on the landscape that we would find them. I modeled detection probability in all models with a pseudo-threshold canopy cover. And this hypothesizes that as canopy cover increases, detection decreases until there's a certain amount of canopy cover that it doesn't matter how much more you add, you can't, um, you can't, uh, it doesn't affect detection, so it levels off. <coughs> so to get into my results, these two panels are uh, of my two uh, um, study areas. And we surveyed a total of 550 view sheds, which included about 53,000 sampling units, um, which are indicated by the, the yellow here. So we covered a lot of terrain over those three summers. And of, of those sampling units, 505 had mountain goat groups, 
in them. 136 were detected by both observers, and 369 were detected by one observer only. And into the uh, model selection results, if you're not familiar with AIC model selection, uh, don't worry about any of these figures, but this is all to say that uh, there were four most supported models in the sloped terrain suite, and they included the quadratic mean slope as well as the slope variance covariates. And those were measured at the 300 to 500 meter spatial scale. You'll notice that there is no distance to escape terrain covariate in, in these top models. Uh, the nearest one was with a slope threshold of 40 degrees, and it was 10 delta QAIC, um, uh, suggesting it has very little support. The rug in this suite had uh, three most supported models with proportion rock in all of them and a ruggedness variable in all of them, and they were both measured at the 300 to 500 meter spatial scale, which was similar to the uh, um, slope terrain suite. The forage suite had one supported model, and that was canopy cover and normalized difference vegetation index, which is uh, essentially a surrogate for forage quality and quantity. And those were both measured at the 100 meter spatial scale. In the heat load suite, I had a covariate that, uh, that I called global radiation come out in all the models, but there was uncertainty for the spatial scale at which it was measured as well as the functional form. And to compare all these models among each other, these model suites among each other, this is just to point out that the, if you look at the delta QAIC and weight column for the sloped terrain suite, uh, they, they have the most support. Uh, there's model weight on the sloped terrain, but there are none when you get into any of the other um, models. Um, so if you remember, I included, so then I took all of these most supported models from each suite, included them in all possible combinations in a combined model suite, and uh, this resulted in four most supported models, and there are general consistencies here as well. We had the quadratic mean slope and the slope variance. That, that one was measured either pseudo-threshold or linear. Um, and they were both at, measured at the 500 meter spatial scale. Canopy cover and NDVI at the, measured at the 100 spatial scale, and global radiation also at the 100 meter spatial scale and model with either linear or pseudo threshold. So given the general consistencies and similarities in these models, I felt comfortable selecting the most supported model as my model of inference uh, to habitat selection in mountain goats. <coughs> and so I want so to understand what this model even means, um, I made some prediction plots based on the regression coefficients. Uh, and holding all other habitat covariates at their mean value. So uh, for the quadratic slope variable, we can see estimated occupancy probability on the y-axis, and uh, the habitat covariate will be on the x-axis. So for slope, there was an optimal uh, slope that maximized estimated occupancy, and that was around 38 degrees. As variability in slope or slope variance increased, estimated occupancy increased. As canopy cover increased, estimated occupancy decreased. As NDVI, or forage quality quantity, increased, estimated occupancy increased. As global radiation increased, estimated occupancy decreased, suggesting that they may actually be sensitive to higher summer temperatures. And finally, the de detection probability was estimated as constant regardless of canopy cover, around 0 0.46 uh, for each sampling unit. And I'll, I'll come back to this later. So now that I had this model, and it seemed to be, uh, the relationship seemed to be biologically uh, sound, um, I wanted to know how well this model actually predicted uh, mountain goat occurrence on the landscape. So I did a model validation. 
To do this, I first mapped uh, the model based on the regression coefficients, and I then had to select an occupancy cutoff value to represent a suitable habitat, which is the dark blue here. And this is for the northern GYA, where there are uh, well-established populations of mountain goats. I then uh, obtained an independent data set. This is aerial survey data from management agencies. Um, and um, yeah. So in, in using this data, I was aware that there were some spatial inaccuracies with the, associated with the locations. And that's because as biologists fly over the landscape, they're documenting uh, where they see those animals. They're not necessarily getting a precise location of those animals as they fly over. And so in addition to calculating the percentage of these points that <coughs> fell within suitable habitat, I also calculated the percentage of points that fell within 100 meters and 200 meters of the suitable habitat that this model identified. And quickly, I just wanted to zoom into an area just to give you an idea of uh, how restricted the, the suitable habitat uh, is and in association with the, the independent data set. This is the Clark's Fork of the Yellowstone, if it's familiar to anybody. So based on about uh, 1,500 point data points from, that, from the aerial survey, 76% of them fell within suitable habitat. About 87% fell within 100 meters, and 93% fell within 200 meters of suitable habitat. And uh, so a vast majority of the, this aerial survey data fell within very close proximity of the, the um, areas that I, that I identified as suitable habitat. So I felt comfortable uh, using uh, this model to extrapolate across the rest of the Greater Yellowstone. And when I did that, uh, it predicted extensive but patchily distributed suitable habitat uh, throughout the GYA, mostly in the, the mountainous regions. And a lot of these areas are currently unoccupied by mountain goats. <coughs> so this indicates they have uh, more room to expand. The total area of the suitable, suitable habitat is about 10,745 square kilometers. And given the total area of the GYA, which is this green polygon, that is about 59,000 square kilometers, the estimated suitable habitat is about 18% of the total GYA. So then I was interested in estimating the potential <coughs> abundance that could be um, supported by um, this suitable habitat. And so to do this, I got cut off there. To do this, I selected two survey areas that had, um, these are areas where management agencies periodically survey for mountain goats, and they have um, recent estimates of abundance associated with them. So using those estimates of abundance, I calculated the density for each of those survey areas, and then I extract, based on my habitat suitability map, I then extrapolated those two densities for the rest of the Greater Yellowstone to provide a range of estimates of the potential abundance of mountain goats that might be supported by uh, the suitable habitat. And that resulted in about 5,400 to 8,900 mountain goats. And given the current abundance, estimated abundance of 2,100 mountain goats, that represents an increase of 2.5 to 4.2 times. All right, so what did, we, what did we learn from all this work? What did we gain from this study? Well, using this uh, new occupancy design that has never been used in any other setting for any other species that I'm aware of, um, we were able to discern scale-specific habitat associations for a relatively rare species on a large landscape. And these methods may be useful for other species uh, that occupy similar sorts of landscapes. 
I was able to develop a multi-scale mountain goat habitat model, um, and this there are no there are no published models that have looked at uh, scale-specific relationships, and so um, I provided new insight into how mountain goats select habitat attributes, and I found that they selected uh, attributes um, at two. Uh, specific spatial scales. Uh, one at the 500 meter spatial scale, which is about 25 hectares, for the slope terrain features of mean slope and slope variance, and at the 100 meter scale, or about one hectare, for canopy cover, heat load, and forage. I, um, I found support for the mean slope and slope variance covariates um, that outcompeted the extensively used distance to escape terrain covariate. And um, so these, these variables may be useful for other species that occupy similar sloped terrain areas as well. And I was able to predict the distribution, the spatial distribution and abundance of mountain goats that may be supported um, in the greater Yellowstone. All right, so some of you may be wondering um, whatever happened to the niche partitioning part with bighorn sheep or looking at competition or overlap. Well, as Bob's in indicated before, uh, that was the intent of this project. Um, however, bighorn sheep were, were just too rare and we weren't able to get a sufficient sample size and we couldn't model them well. Fortunately, however, we have Blake Lowry who has joined Bob Garrett's lab and is using a different uh, data set using a broad scale GPS telemetry study to address competition and niche overlap between these two species. Additionally, you might remember that detection was modeled as constant regardless of canopy cover and for each sampling unit it was estimated at 0 0.46. Uh, this, this is an underestimate and this was an unfortunate compromise we had to make based, uh, because we used these small sampling units, um, trying to get at that fine scale selection. And this is because when we had these double observers surveying the same view shed at the same time, they weren't necessarily looking in the same sampling unit at the same time, while mountain goat groups were moving across the landscape and uh, um, moving in and out of sampling units. And observers also recorded um, sampling units as occupied as mountain goat groups moved across the landscape. And that likely eroded any signal we could have gotten from the effect of canopy cover on detection probability um, and also underestimated our detection for the sampling units. So this may have been a disadvantage of, my, um, of the model, the methods that we used. Um, However, the model validation lends support that the occupancy end of things appeared to do a good job for modeling habitat selection. So overall, I felt that we gained some new ecological insight for mountain goats and uh, at different spatial scales and I was able to estimate the potential extent of expansion in the GYA that should be useful for uh, management agencies across the GYA as mountain goats um, are predicted to uh, expand into new areas and as they um, increase in number. And it should help them develop um, management and conservation plans for both mountain goats and bighorn sheep in the future. And many of these agencies who are interested in this sort of information are listed here. They have invested in this project, and um, I extend gratitude to them for their funding and collaboration. And I'm thankful to the myriad of individuals who have made this project a success, and uh, I'm indebted to all of you. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. I'm sure he wants to have as many questions in the public forum as possible now, so I'm 
There must be a few questions from the audience. <laughs> Serena? I have two questions. Okay. Um, how much confidence do you have in this model predictability? And the second question is that based on your model predictability, how long does it take to get to the result? Like 80% of the uh, and the of the Well, I'll answer the second question first. <laughs> Um, I did not look into the, uh, the amount of time it might take for this, these areas to become um, occupied. So I don't really have an estimate for that. Um, Bob might have a, an idea of like based on uh, previous uh, expansion, but um, it also depends on like how, uh, how far apart that suitable habitat is. Um, some areas, like in the, I think in the Wind River ranges, it's um, quite a distance they have to go to get to that new new territory. So, um. yeah, we really don't have data to address the the speed at which range expansion can occur. But it's very interesting to think that mountain goats were introduced in the 40s and 50s in the northern GYA, and they had them in gotten through the GYA and, and contrast that with um, uh, um, uh, wolves that were introduced in the late 1990s in the earth throughout the northern Rockies, throughout the whole northwestern United States. From the so obviously mountain goats have a di very different potential for dispersal or at least dispersal rate to occupy the area. Um, and then to get to your other question, so Serena was uh, talking about uncertainty in the model, which is kind of grayed out here, but um, associated with all these estimates are um, confidence intervals, and so there is uncertainty associated with all these estimates. And all of, it, all of this uncertainty gets put into um, my, my model here, and I am, I am still looking into that, to be honest going to look at the uncertainty associated with, uh, with these estimates. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Megan? I'm curious, did you end up alternating between single and double observer surveys, or did you guys transition to double only? Or? Um, so uh, when we started with Megan, we were um, trying to figure out what the balance was, how many I didn't, I didn't actually talk about that we did single observer surveys. So some few sheds only had one observer uh, surveying them. With Megan, we were uh, playing around with, do we need double observers every time, or do we need single observers? Um, pretty much the two years after you, we, we tried to do all double surveys. I'm just wondering when you show when you're matching your model to the model, to the aerial data. Yeah. I was wondering, are you are most of your misses when they're like up on top, like when you can't see them from the ground? I'm wondering if, if you would how much your model might improve if you took like half of each data set and fit on that. So, what did you say that again? Sorry. So, are you when you're missing? in your model when they're seeing sheep outside of where you predict are goats doing it. Tell my eyes. Um, are you are your misses when the goats are like up on top? From the aerial survey data? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how to to look at those. Right. I was curious if you had an idea about how to get that in there because I want to get that into it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. So why didn't you split the data in half? For validation, that's what you're at. That was the other part of the question. Well, yeah, I wondered about fitting on half of each data set and then validating. Oh, I see. Never thought about it. <laughs> 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 Why do you build models on the Bitcoin data set? Oh, yeah, okay. Because <laughs> we, oh, so you're saying split the my data set in, into. I thought you were talking about split the aerial data set. No, I, oh, what okay. I was suggesting I was split the aerial data set yeah. in half, split your data set in half, and oh, yeah, then yeah, fit yeah. on. Okay. Yeah, we 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 definitely thought about that. I definitely thought about that. Um, but we were uncomfortable uh, 
uh, taking out any data because the sample size is already um, so low. And we were having uh, uh, convergence issues with some of the models. So, uh, yep, low sample size. So detection, and do you explain the process where you win or down your models for size? And he, you pretty much just said you modeled it as a function of can be covered? Yeah. Was that just sort of an a priori decision that you, you only looked at as one thing? That might it was, and it was partly to, to simplify the complexity of these model lists. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something uh, that would be good to look at in the future. Because I made, because with the, it was based on previous literature, um, but uh, I didn't do any model selection, so I don't know. There could have been other covariates, such as ruggedness or something, that actually uh, explains that variation better, but I, I didn't look at it. Maybe distance from observer to cell could be a, worth a retrospective look? Or? It, it could be, yep. Because it's we were looking at uh, we tried to limit how far we were looking. Um, we had a cutoff distance that we looked, um, but uh, there could have been I mean, just distance could have a factor. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you didn't have enough data to conclusively say. The, uh, the sheep were getting displaced by goats because the sample size was too small. But in your subjective, completely non scientific opinion, <laughs> 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 um, So I, I do tend to believe that the, their niches are um, partitioned enough. Uh, they do overlap. I mean, they will eat similar species, similar forest species. They will occupy similar habitats. But I don't think it's enough uh, necessarily, especially during the summer, to actually have an impact. Um, um, and I mean, I don't know. Based on some of our observations as well, um, I think we had a total of four or something of them within close proximity. And they were pretty, all of them were pretty neutral interactions, so it wasn't like mountain goats were actually being aggressive, although there have been documented aggressiveness between them, but I think the majority of stuff is neutral. Um, and uh, um, I was gonna say one more thing, I forgot. So I think generally, at least during in, on their summer range, there's, uh, there's not uh, a lot of overlap in, Competition is is minimized there. So. The, the goats typically live in groups or herds of sorts, don't they? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. The small groups. They live like very small groups. Do they? Um, what kind of a range do they have? Like most animals have a range that they travel within. And I'm thinking about how they spread, and is it a matter of the sustainability of the forage where they're at, or is that kind of outside the scope of what you're looking at in terms of how or where they might move? Yeah, I think that's a little outside the scope of my stuff, but I don't know, Bob might have something to say. I think the torn piece studies have helped us with that a lot, a lot more. I have a picture of rogue goats moving into a new neighborhood for unknown reasons. Well, right? obviously, given how slow they've dispersed in, in over half a century, yeah. they, they're more likely to be off using a, a relatively small area and not doing a lot of exploring. Although on that early, that early map, you see there were red dots all the way through the GYA. So there are goats colonizing every place. You know. But that can be, that could be decades uh, before the population is actually established. Hey, I have a question for you, Jesse. I have a couple. Um, <laughs> my turn. The radiation? Yeah. Yeah, what, what is that? And what, were you surprised that it was important at the 100 meter scale rather than like at a larger scale? Like um, you know, I, it, so, okay, so the, the global radiation um, covariate, this one was specifically, um, it's the, the radiation index you can calculate right in ArcMap 
it uh, accounts for aspect, it accounts for latitude um, okay. on, the, on the globe. And uh, um, I, I wasn't that surprised because we do see these, we see goats like hanging out in caves and occasionally. Okay. It's very fine scale places that you'll find them hanging out. Um, so I kind of thought that was an interesting, interesting, interesting point. Yeah, I asked that because I, when I was up at this summer at Baronet, they were all up on the side facing away from the sun. They were all sitting, you know, there was like a hundred goats up there. Yeah. It was facing east and on the other side there was nobody home. So it was obvious they liked it cold and nice and shady, but that's a huge mountain. Yeah. And you would have thought then the scale of modeling would have yeah, been different you, than what you, you saw. You tend to there. see, I mean, you see that yeah. sort of stuff happening, but we yeah. also see it at a fine scale. So. Yeah. And then did you guys, I know you're picking up collars and looking at mortality, did you see a lot of predation or evidence for predation on these goats? We think so. Um, I think Bob should talk about it. Are they hunted? Are, we? Are they hunted by people? By people? Yeah. 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 But very, very limited. But limited, so, yeah. So we have, you know, they have very high survival. So even though we have yeah. 120, I don't know, how, you know, we don't have that many out goats. Goats are really hard to catch. Um, we certainly have strong evidence that that grizzly bears are ambushing when they're moving okay. off those steep train yeah. and they're transitioning through. Mm -hmm. Through forested areas, we've got a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, we're highly suspected. Yeah. There's a bear mountain lions as well. And, that, and you know, what's called escape terrain is just perfect terrain for, for mountain lions to work. So, that might yeah. be not yeah. necessarily the right description of rugged terrain for goats. So, both of those, those uh, and there's lots of evidence in the literature that golden eagles are extremely significant predator on the young. And you see that when they're doing surveys. They yeah. have a bunch of goats or sheep out on the cliff, and a golden eagle comes sweeping in that canyon, and everybody runs like hell. <laughs> it gets in the cover. So that would suggest okay. that eagles yeah. are constantly challenging yeah. those groups out and those exposed. So right. escape terrain from what? Like yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so. the ghost of predator past. So <laughs> Escape time yeah. argument for, for, yeah. for why goes okay. there. <laughs> I wondered about that. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we better let Jesse move on to the last stage of his, <laughs> or his graduate career here. And I uh, appreciate everybody's attention and great questions, and thanks a lot for everybody attending. Well done.